as we've been talking about the piano, the piano capable of a lot of drama, let's move to the romantic piano. The piano is more modern, capable of more sound and more color. And so I'm going to talk about two composers who lived during the Romantic period, uh, Friedrich Chopin and Franz Liszt. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of others, but these two certainly cornered the market, I think, on piano music and the advancement of piano uh, technique, and I have to choose. And that's the unfortunate part about this uh, period of time. I have to choose which composer's going to be what. Because with Schubert, we could have talked about his symphonies. With Schubert, we could have talked about chamber music. So I'm going to bring in, with each composer, their you know, specialty. So I had to cut this down. There are a lot of others, but I have chosen Chopin and Liszt to be our examples of <coughs> piano music in the uh, Romantic period. And these guys, this is the reason why I picked them, is these guys are really opposite. You know, Chopin, charming, the poet of the piano, as we will see. Uh, very understated, passionate music. Liszt, on the other hand, is going to give you the real dazzling technique. Okay? The real dazzling technique, uh, powerful sound, and uh, so they're really very, very, very different. So we will take... Uh, Mr. Chopin first. But before we do that, I want to talk about um, the genres, piano genres, in the Romantic period. We know we have two that already exist, the concerto and the sonata, right? The concerto is for piano and orchestra. The sonata is for piano alone. And that continues on from, gosh, from uh, the... Uh, Baroque and classical periods. Um, and so those are the large forms. And what's so interesting in the Romantic period, you have the large forms and the small forms, the miniature and the monumental. And that's perfect to put in the Romantic period because the Romantic period is one of great extremes. You know, we're always going to talk about extremes, whether it be the orchestra or the piano, and this is another example. You have the extreme, the concerto, and then we're going to introduce an interesting smaller piano genre, and that is the character piece. A character piece is a short, free piano piece that evokes a mood, some type of mood, and there are many, many, many of them. I'm just going to give you some examples. Example, a nocturne. A nocturne is a very short and, again, very free piano piece. And it is giving us an example of what? What does nocturnal mean? Night. And so this is a very free-flowing piece, probably not in a fast tempo, not to make you jittery, but to relax you. Uh, we also have something like an impromptu. That's a very good word to put on the uh, romantic period. Spontaneous. You know, something very spontaneous. Um, an etude is another uh, character piece. And an etude is a learning piece. It's something you give your students to help them become better uh, pianists. It's a learning piece. Now, you also can go to each piano composer's country. We're going to see that Chopin was born in Poland. We will see his polonaises and his mazurkas. Those are characteristic of Poland. We'll see Liszt's Hungarian dances. Those are characteristic of Hungary, you see. So we're also getting into uh, some cultural differences with these character pieces. And they are numerous, too numerous to mention, and we're going to look at a couple. So, again, the piano genres of the Romantic uh, period. And so, Chopin. Often considered the poet of the piano and one of this teacher's most favorite, probably one of my Desert Island... Uh, composers. He was really one of the only great composers to compose exclusively for the piano. Exclusively for the piano. Chopin was brought up in Warsaw, or Warsaw, Poland, um, and he was the son of a Polish mother and a French father. Uh, when he was very young, his, he had an original style of piano playing already, and his uh, composing really was very accepted by the Polish aristocracy. And I tell you, I just returned from Warsaw. Uh, I went to Poland this year, and Warsaw is a beautiful city, 
and they revere Chopin. Everything is Chopin this, Chopin that, and um, he is just treasured and, and should be. Um, after graduating from the Warsaw Conservatory, uh, he was a concert pianist. Concert pianist. And now, of course, during the Romantic period, we have the rise of public concerts. I go pay, and I see the great Chopin playing a concerto or playing by himself, right? And so we have public concerts now. And uh, so Chopin was on a, a concert tour playing his um, own compositions. Unfortunately, one time while he was away, the Poles, unfortunately, the Poles revolted against the Russians, and the Russians take over Warsaw. And Chopin, Chopin was just filled with despair, filled with despair. And I quote, they have burnt down the town, and here I am doing nothing, only heaving sighs and pouring out the grief at my piano. What a, what a romantic statement, right? They have taken over my, uh, my city, and so I'm just going to pour my grief out at the piano. In 1831, he arrives in Paris, and that's where he would spend the rest of his life. Um, and of course, if you look at those dates, they were, that was a very short life, and, and it was 1810 to 1849. So he died when he was 39 years old. Now, during the 1830s, Paris, Paris was an artistic center as well. Certainly, we've talked about Vienna now for a long time, haven't we? <laughs> we've talked about Vienna for a while. And now we're going to talk a little bit about Paris. Um, it was really one of the artistic capitals of Europe. And Chopin goes there and meets Franz Liszt and meets the writer Victor Hugo and Balzac and Hein and the painter Delacroix, right? Liberty Leading the People, which we, we saw. Um, and so Chopin hung out with these people. What, what I love to, I would just love to be a fly on the wall when they all got together and had conversations. I mean, it must be certainly amazing. His, uh, Certainly, his playing became very popular in Paris, uh, as it was anywhere else. Uh, Liszt actually provides us with a description of the kind of people who attended Chopin's rare concerts. He was, by the way, a very small man, very slight in stature, not well for a lot of his life. And so when you think about him playing the piano, a very, very frail man, um, you think about a gentle touch. He was also very shy, and he didn't like playing for huge audiences. He'd be very, very comfortable with everybody here sitting down at the piano and playing. But his personality wasn't one of, hey, everybody watch me. You know, it was very introspective. He's a very introspective kind of person. Um, Numerous carriages brought, the most elegant ladies, the most fashionable of young men, the richest financiers, the most illustrious great lords, an entire aristocracy of birth fortune, and beauty. So the big guns came out to hear Chopin play. But again, his frail physique made it very impossible for him to draw big sounds out of the piano. And that's often why we call him the poet of the piano, because it's, it's a very charming, uh, introspective music. And his playing, rather than give you fast and loud, even though he does a lot, a lot of points, but the emphasis on his um, his compositions are just the atmospheric use of the pedal underneath the piano, which is going to give us a lot of different colors, certainly, and uh, certainly dynamics, color, and uh, poetry, singing. Chopin's life took a very uh, productive turn when he met Aurora Dudevant, and she was a well-known novelist, and some of you might know her. Her name was... George Sand. Anybody heard, hear, hear of George Sand before? George Sand was a writer of well, erotic literature. And you see, she couldn't be published, you know, in the 1830s in Paris, right? Couldn't be published. And so what she did was she changed her name, George Sand, and she was published. She was a very interesting character, often wore men's clothing, smoked cigars. Okay. And so he, she meets frail, shy Chopin. And they have this um, relationship. She was quite the feminist, I tell you. And they became uh, lovers when uh, uh, he was 28 and she was 34. So this was a very interesting relationship. Some, though, say that, that it wasn't a sexual relationship. They just basically, you know, kind of 
kind of took care of each other. And she did. She took care of him until the end of his life because uh, his health really rapidly declined very, very, very quickly. And before dying of tuberculosis at age 39, uh, Chopin asked that Mozart's Requiem be played at his funeral. And uh, they also played some of his music as well. Now, why does Dr. Muchnick love Chopin so much? It is a personal, it's a personal style that Chopin has. He gives his guts into that piano. And I hope by listening to it, you know, I can't force it on you. You gotta love this. But I don't know how anybody couldn't. It's just beautiful music, beautiful music. Um, always difficult for the piano. Any pianist will tell you the difficulty factor of Chopin is very, very, very high. We have a variety of mood. We have the very melancholy, we have the heroic, you name it, we hear it with Chopin through um, the love of the piano. We also hear his native Poland. We hear the polonaises and mazurkas that he gives us that, again, are Polish dances. Uh, so we hear quite a lot of that. But he, nobody quite made, you know, composed for the piano as well as, as Chopin, I think, as far as beautiful sound. And so we are going to listen to um, uh, three examples. The first one, Nocturne in E-flat major. The second one is that a Polish dance, a Polonaise in A-flat major. And an etude in C minor, the very popular, and you, a lot of you will probably recognize this, the revolutionary etude in C minor. So enjoy this. This gives you a little taste of what Chopin can do for your life. And I, it is my hope that everybody's just going to run and buy this music. That was uh, Friedrich Chopin. And so three little uh, desserts, if you will, of Chopin. And there's a, a wide variety of, of stuff by Chopin to listen to. My personal favorites, uh, two piano concertos with the most glorious slow movements in them. Um, unfortunately, as a string player, I can tell you that sitting playing one of his concertos is not. I mean, he really didn't know quite what to do with the orchestra. He really tried. He really tried, and it's worth it because the pianist plays the whole time, basically. And he was very, very, it's very obvious, but he did try, and they are glorious pieces of music. Okay, now, from the sublime to the ridiculous, and now I'm going to get letters that I said that. Franz Liszt. We go from the poet of the piano, this fragile Chopin, to a handsome, long haired, magnetic young man who performed superhuman feats at the piano. Franz Liszt. An incredible showman at the piano. He was a great pianist, people, a great pianist. Um, and also quite the womanizer. Born 1811, died 1886, left a trail of broken hearts from Paris to Moscow. Um, Brahms, Johannes Brahms, said this about Liszt. Whoever has not heard Liszt cannot speak of piano playing. I mean, this guy could play faster and louder and trill faster and play octaves faster than anyone. The guy practiced and practiced and practiced and became just the god of the piano. Now, one of the reasons why he uh, practiced and practiced and practiced is kind of an interesting story. He went to a concert by uh, one of the great violinists of the day, concert violinists. His name was Paganini. And Paganini could play faster and louder than anybody else as far as the violin goes. Well, Liszt wanted to do what Paganini did on the violin on the piano. Hey, if I do that, I, women will love me. And he was right. Mm -hmm. 
You know, he was the real rock star of the piano. You know, he, people flocked to see this guy. Athletic, superhuman feats on the piano. Okay? It's very, very interesting. And so Chopin, now Liszt, two very different approaches to playing the piano. One, not better necessarily than the other. I'm not trying to, you know, put it down, put Liszt down or anything, but it's just sometimes it gets to, gets to the point where I can't, I can't think, I can't listen to it. It's so crazy sometimes. I love Liszt, though. An outstanding pace setter in the history of music. Not only was he a, um, a pianist, he also wrote a lot about new music. He was an essayist, wrote a lot about new music, and uh, was a very, very intelligent, uh, intelligent man. When he was 19, he was already a brilliant pianist, right? He was already a br brilliant pianist. And what was so interesting is that um, after he saw Pognini play, he went back and he took like a couple of years off so he could play just like Paganini. And he did, and he came back on the scene, and he really could play faster and louder than anybody else. My piano, he wrote, my piano, is my very self, my mother tongue, my life. A man's ten fingers have the power to reproduce the harmonies which are created by hundreds of performers. Once, following an orchestral performance of a movement from Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, which we will listen to, Liszt played his own piano arrangement of the movement and made a more powerful effect than the entire orchestra. That's what the guy, he was just jealous of the orchestra. That's it. He, he couldn't play anything else. And so here he goes to a concert, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, and then he comes out and he plays his arrangement. And that's what we hear from Liszt, a lot of arrangements of stuff that, that is pre-existing. He will take a, a song or, or, or something and elaborate on it. Uh, and he really, it's very, very interesting music. In the piano, he'll give three Ps. Three Ps, to play that soft on the piano is very difficult to do. To play three Fs on the piano is difficult to do. It's called muscle music. And so Liszt exploits the piano. And some consider it vulgar and bombastic, and others, Revel in it, revel in it. And certainly pianists love to play it because, my goodness, it makes them look superhuman after they do it, right? Um, boy, am I going to get letters now. Um, now, what I want you to do is listen to this, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Uh, this is a transcendental etude, number 10, in F minor. So after I've talked about this showman, superhuman pianist, piano composer, now listen to his music and we'll come back and talk about it. That was uh, Liszt's tran Transcendental Etude in F minor, number 10. And uh, what we hear is a lot, a lot of activity. Even when there's a gorgeous melody going on in either left or right hand, uh, the other hand is always busy. Yes, we have melody, but we have a lot, a lot of interesting things going on, and it just doesn't stop. And he was a virtuoso, and boy, could he play these pieces as well. And uh, it's very, very athletic music. Um, but Liszt also gave us transcriptions of operas um, and symphonies, and it made um, possible for people to play great orchestral works at their own piano. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he was obsessed with this idea that the piano could be just as powerful as the orchestra. Now, uh, before I leave Liszt, I have to mention that he was also very important in uh, the creation of what's called the symphonic poem. Now, I'm not going to bring this in until the later uh, romantic composers, but I just want to tell you about it. It's simply a one-movement orchestral composition based uh, on a literary or a pictorial idea. And so this goes with the idea of uh, program music. And what Liszt uh, did so beautifully was uh, he broke away from the standard four-movement symphony and just gave us um, uh, exactly from uh, word for word 
uh, some poetry on exactly what um, uh, the instruments could do for something literary. So what Schubert was doing with the piano and the voice, Liszt was doing with the literary and the orchestra as well. And so he is important, and he w did do a lot of uh, uh, serious uh, criticism as well. And so he was important in a lot of different ways. So yes, a pianist, but also a writer on music as well, supporter of new music, and also um, uh, a great symphonist as well. Using the symphonic poem, he also wrote symphonies. And so there is a lot to him. Um, so that gives you some idea of the different types of piano music in the Romantic period. And so we've come up through the discussion of the rom Romantic music, Schubert and the art song, which is new, and uh, Chopin and Liszt and the character piece, which is also new. So we've talked about our new genres. And uh, next time, we're going to go back to the old ones, the or orchestral genres that are a little bit more expanded than Beethoven. OK, thank you very much.